What's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg, and this is another Chance Encounter. Hey, what's up? I'm Dan Fradenberg. I'm a commercial real estate guy. I'm from the internet. We're seeing uh, we're seeing more properties like this being built in front of a house. It's going to be torn down soon. I understand that there are power lines that are just kind of close. What's up again? This is Dan Fradenberg, and that there is a commercial real estate building. I'm joined today with Alex. Is it Kodnev? Is that how you uh, pronounce that? Good. Godnev. Okay, Godnev. Excellent, excellent. And how are you doing today, Alex? Pretty good, pretty good. It's been a beautiful day here in Israel. It's we are seven hours ahead from Eastern Standard Time, so it's it's almost five o'clock. Yeah, it's been great. Yeah, excellent, excellent. We got great weather here, but I got to tell you the reason why I'm really happy today. I'm really happy today because my very favorite audience member has joined us today. And why has my favorite audience member joined us today? It's because this is a chance encounter where I interview commercial real estate syndicators, that's buyers, sellers, operators, all that kind of stuff. And why would I do such a thing? Well, part of it is because you need to know if there's any overlap between you and other syndicators anybody in the circle and the other thing too is you also need to document the relationship for 506b compliance to show that you have a prior substantive relationship so it just makes a lot more sense to meet everybody find out what is their tolerance for risk what's their buy box and the beautiful thing is you get to learn how to effectively communicate on the subject of commercial real estate in a way that's not boring but before we get too excited about that alex you already mentioned that you're in israel uh do you want to say another uh, thing or two about yourself before we get started um, so I've been doing real estate in the States since 2017, uh, started in the single family field, flipping houses, renting houses, building my own, my own small portfolio until we, uh, um, we learn how to do syndications for multifamily. A couple of years ago, we start digging and then we found a deal, syndicated, looking for more. And it's, it's a whole beautiful, interesting work. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. I love it. And it, uh, that, that resembles my own journey somewhat. And before I talk to uh, talk about the five motivations, I got to say, but wait, check your eight. And uh, I, Alex, I don't know if you have the ability, if you pretend that there's a, a clock around your, your, your camera here, and then if you look down at where eight o'clock would be, there's probably in the audience's device, there might be a big hideous red button that says subscribe. And like they should have the gray one, but they may have that. No, it's just a stupid joke I like to do. So the first segment here is the five distinct motivations. And I've met a lot of commercial syndicators. And after I take all of their unique reasons for making their next commercial acquisition, after all, it takes months. It's a lot of money, a lot of risk. You got to have a really good reason to do it. And so I want to know what that is. And so I've I've found that these five are very distinct. The first one is preserving your purchasing power. What's that all about? Some people already have a portfolio of assets and the way they make ends meet is because of the profits that come from that ownership. Now, why would somebody like this make another acquisition? Well, there's two circumstances. One is if inflation is coming around, you don't wanna sell off your assets, but you're gonna use your portfolio as, uh, as collateral to make your next acquisition to stave off what the inflation is doing to your, uh, to your purchasing power of your cash flow. The other situation for these people is if there's an asset crash and you can buy at a discount, then they'll be scooping up these properties. That's not what I'm up to. What I'm up to is trading time directly for wealth. And what that's all about, see, I've got a background in technology. Specifically, it's in the CRM industry, the fancy ones where you actually accept credit cards. And so I've been building these online funnels for, for uh, 12 years now. And what the problem with getting a high salary or a high wage is that you're paying more in tax than anybody else. So as I learned more about real estate, I eventually pivoted because I'm like, well, it makes more sense to be rewarded in the form of deployed capital, AKA equity, instead of in cash. So that's why I'm doing this. But a lot of people come into commercial real estate because they wanna take control of their schedule. 
That might mean that they want to fast track retirement, or it might mean that they want to work fewer months per year or fewer weeks per month or fewer hours per week. Who knows what it is, but that's what these guys are up to is they're trying to take control of their schedule. But the next group, they're quite different from that. They're just plain ambitious. They want to buy their entire hometown. They want to get that generational wealth to make sure that their great grandchildren never have to hold a day job. Okay. And that's not what I'm up to. What, uh, but the other group that I have to say, the, the fifth one of the bunch, some people, they have similar financial ambitions, but their motivation is a bit different because they've picked a sector of society or maybe the environment or maybe animals or whatever it is but you need to have a big financial backing if you're going to make a big difference and that's why these people are making their next acquisition so alex of those five different motivations uh what combination of them stood out and would you say would uh, describe you best oh yeah, of those five different regions, so there's the the per, uh, purchasing power preservation. Okay, then yeah. the, the second one was trading time for wealth instead of for salary or wages. Then there was uh, fast tracking retirement. There was uh, just plain ambitious, and then the last one is uh, trying to save the world. So, what combination of those sounds like you? I think my play is trading time to wealth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Instead of being an employee in some company and just going and working for W2 wage and paycheck and all that kind of stuff. So now I'm working for myself, I'm building my own wealth. And this is this is completely different psychology. This is completely different uh, a mindset. Okay, then you approach your financials. This is number one. Number two, retirement. Yes, obviously. We want hard, we want to work hard today. Uh, in order to work less in, in the future, but not like a long future, you know, like being 60 years old, 70, you know, that kind of stuff, but in a few years, just, yeah. So th mm -hmm. that's my wife. All right. Awesome. Awesome. So my next question then, it has to do with the tolerance for risk assessment. And see some people, especially young people, they get into commercial real estate because they're like, hey, there's a bunch of money floating around. So I'm going to be rich. It's like, yeah, there's risk involved. I like to say that real estate is the second oldest profession. And so that's why there's a lot of people involved. So uh, I like to do this fill in the blank question to make sure that people understand those risks. So Alex, there are many popular investment assets classes but i think blank is too risky it doesn't have to be real estate it can be whatever what do you think is too risky in my opinion whatever you cannot control is too risky mm -hmm. okay and then they say like a cryptocurrency or stock market okay i'm pretty much not not into that i don't know about that much but i just know you cannot control it right so so it's only my opinion okay? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I love it. That's fantastic. And that brings us straight to commercial real estate, which, of course, it's something that's like, well, there are all sorts of things you can control. There's some things you can't. But in every episode of Dan Does Deals Chance Encounters, I go through the Dan Does Deals Core Competency Cube. And you can get your copy at dandoesdeals.com. It's totally free. I don't even ask for your email address. And from a marketing perspective, that's the worst thing you can possibly do. You should always ask for the contact information so that you can get a hold of them after. But the reason I don't do that is because I want to have no barriers for you to be able to print out your own copy practice explaining these six different sides and that way you can effectively communicate to your friends your family whoever else on the subject of commercial real estate deals and more importantly you also will know how my guest fits into these deals so in every episode i go through all six sides and let's get started the first one is the repositioner role. The repositioner looks at many different properties and does a bunch of different paperwork. What are they doing oh. with the paperwork? Well, they have a fancy word for it. They call it underwriting. That means they're doing the math. They're figuring out, first of all, is this property even making the amount of money that the seller or the broker is claiming that it is? But a lot of people call these people investors. I call them repositioners because they're trying to figure out how can they change how the property is run so that there's more upside. The first place they're going to be looking, this is part of every repositioner's job, is investor relations, talking to financiers. Financiers are people who only deal with money and paper. 
And so they're not doing active work, but the reason why the financiers are so important is because if the repositioner can get a more advantageous loan, that goes straight to the bottom line of the business. So they're always looking for cheaper money, cheaper loans. But let's assume that the repositioner doesn't have access to that. The first place they're going to look is the operations. They're going to stop those Benjamins from going down those toilets. But of course, there's a lot more to operations than just unclogging toilets and collecting rent, and mowing lawns and all that kind of stuff. There's also one thing that, uh, which is a forte of mine, is there's a marketing component, which has to do with reducing the amount of vacancy on the property. And there's other uh, things as well, like automations for different inventory but um, especially in the bigger properties though, you're gonna be outsourcing that anyway, so you're more in an asset management role. But if operations, you know, chances are there, there's not enough room, enough upside for the repositioner in just the operations to, uh, to make the deal make sense. So they're gonna get a contractor team involved to do a value add or do the renovations to the units. And the reason for that is it's so that the next tenant will be happy to pay more in rent than the previous one. And that right there is upside. But you can still spend way too much money on contractors. It can also cost a lot of time because they're just, you know, dragging their feet. So one problem that one way that you can fix that, especially if you're like me, I don't know if you know this, but I'm from the internet. So that means I need locals. I need boots on the ground, somebody who can be there in an hour or two, because that's not going to be me. I'd still be stuck at the, hour, at the airport in an hour or two. So the local has to make sure that the contractor isn't cutting corners and they're keeping uh, to schedule and all that. Same with the operators, operators, right? But when the repositioner has this team and turns around to the financier and says, hey, I got this deal that I want to pick up. It's tens of millions of dollars. Do you happen to have, say, tens of millions of dollars you want to lend us? And the financier is going to have one more question on their mind that I haven't addressed yet, which is they're going to want to know, okay, who's the sponsor or KP? And what's that all about? Well, many coaching programs, gurus and whatnot, they gloss over this piece because there's a little bit of a secret about it, which is even if you are like a physician or something like that, you got lots of wealthy friends, you want to take over a 350 unit apartment complex, something like that. Well, to be eligible for a commercial loan and therefore get leverage, somebody in the fold has to already own a similar asset. Okay, so you can't be taking over a 350 unit apartment complex and get a loan unless somebody in the fold already owns a 350 unit apartment complex and likely in that area. So that's why they're going to want to know who the sponsor KP is. On top of what I said, you need a certain amount of liquidity and you need a balance sheet among the ownership team of at least the amount of the loan. But if you have all those pieces, you've got yourself a commercial real estate deal. So Alex, I know that you uh, invest in, uh, in America and so that makes you a form of a repositioner. Uh, but, uh, and then of course, everybody has some financier relations because you gotta be talking to investors and all that kind of stuff. But uh, your core competencies, that you bring to your next deal, uh, what, which of those do you focus on? I mean, we focus obviously on underwriting, right? Repositioning, okay, like underwriting, this is how we, um, this is how we calculate the, the numbers uh, and what kind of offer we can actually place, okay? If the offer makes sense for both, of, for both of the sides, okay? So then we move forward, okay? And we start to work with operation with some local guy which is like boots on the ground or like a property management company or maybe the broker who uh, help us to evaluate this property. And in that time that we enter to the diligence process, some of us, me or my partners, we come visit this property and we personally do the due diligence, okay? And that way we actually know we do not, do not miss anything. Okay, any like interior stuff or like exterior roofs, whatever. Um, then we start to uh, communicate with the lenders, with the, with the banks or uh, whoever is that, and uh, shop for a loan. At the same time, we look who can be the best uh, sponsor slash a KP for the project, and we uh, we show him a deal, and he show us uh, his own experience and his track record and his capabilities, okay, and we see how we can meet each other, okay, so in order him to 
to come into our uh, partnership and, and, and sign for this loan, he's going to take a part of this deal. He's going to be a part of the GP general partnership, right? So we negotiate that. We meet in the middle. We move forward. Okay. And then we come to the closing. There is a, a, a loan um, have to be ready. All the documents have to be ready. We uh, rise private equity on this moment until the closing. So that way uh, uh, we, we are able to close. So we do the actual closing and then we start the value add process, right? We uh, shift the gear slowly and it's not, uh, it's, it's a little bit time consuming process. Okay. Because you know, I all, I call multifamily. It's like a big animal, right? It's like an elephant, right? So it waits a lot and you spend a lot of time and the energy to uh to push it forward and to make it move but once it moves slowly and, and faster and faster it is moves and it's a lot of energy moving forward right so it is a little bit time consuming yeah and then you come to the construction you start the renovation process one by one um and you go out to the market and uh, you uh uh market these properties for rent obviously and it's not sometimes it's not like that uh um small for like like what you uh hope is gonna be so you have to be like a little bit uh creative on this for example our title company or not title company but the management company on our last deal right we had some challenges by the beginning to rent these uh, renovated units for the amount of money we underwrote, right? So what we did, this management company was actually about to replace their own website, which is was way, which is way like, like more, you know, user friendly, more beautiful and just easy to use, right? At the same time, we saw that our property management taking the pictures of the units with his own iPhone, right? And the quality was like so, so, so uh, from my personal uh, point of view and my experience, I know that uh, um, in the era of social media and that kind of stuff, picture is what sells real estate, right? And from my uh, flipping career. So what we did, we just, uh, we called for the best known photographer in this town, right? A real estate photographer. And he did all the pictures, interior and exterior. Okay, so you can say, hey, 400 bucks for the pictures. It's a lot, but then you have units which are all the same, looking the same, same layout. So you use picture that you did just once for market all the units. Mm -hmm. So this expense is minor, but it brings you so much attention, so much interest. Okay. So since then we get we get the success to rent these units for the numbers we was underwriting and even more. So mm -hmm. now we are ahead of our business plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So turn the units one by one, placing them on marketplace and just renting them out. It's, mm -hmm. it's a process. It's a process. Definitely, yeah. definitely beautiful. So, but the next question that I have for you is for the buy box and I'll go through this super quickly. There are three things that are part of a buy box when commercial syndicators, buyers, sellers are talking to each other. The first one's geography. So which states, which counties, possibly even which neighborhood. That's the first one. The second one's going to be the size. We're talking about multifamily for the most part and multifamily goes off of unit counts because you're going to have different groups of people taking over 15 units unit apartment complexes compared to 150, 350 unit apartment complexes. So that size is definitely going to matter. But the third one is often called class, but it's actually split into two parts that I actually call condition and area. When you're talking about condition, it's talking about how old is it? Is it up to date or is it old? Is it beat up or is it well maintained? Is it really no frills or does it have a bunch of uh, luxuries So and amenities? So that's the first meaning, which is the condition. The second one, area it has to do with how much traffic goes by that property it has to do with the crime rate where the property is located it has to do with the school districts that are where the property is located and both of those two meanings of class are rated as the same system as in grade school with a plus at the top and then a and then a minus and b plus and so on so uh, Alex as far as uh, deals that are perfect for you and your organization uh, what's easier to say yes to and more difficult to say no to 
So yeah, as you spoke, I took a couple of notes for myself just in order to know what I'm gonna answer. Okay, so first, picking location. Okay, we are targeting whatever is in the Carolinas, North and South Carolina, and uh, uh, North and Central Florida as well. Okay, so this is our our areas which where we are targeting. Okay, um, we're probably not gonna go with a super central prime location like Charlotte or like Miami because it's super hot. So very competitive, but whatever is like suburb or secondary market is a good go for us. Uh, speaking about the size, we want to be on at least 30 units a complex, mm -hmm. right? And this is for the minimum. For the maximum size, we do not have any maximum limits for the units, but for the purchase price, okay, it's going to be $10 million. And it's only because uh, where we uh, feel our capabilities to be able to raise that private equity. Okay, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. And then speaking the class, we are. Uh, so you you've been spoke about uh, uh, the age of the property, um, how what kind of grade we give it, and then like the area. So mm -hmm. whatever is C to B class, this mm -hmm. is a go for us. Okay, we do not gonna uh, aim on anything to on A A class because it's. Uh, also super expensive and it's also uh, the returns are very low right mm -hmm. but then on, on b or c class you can actually add value take these classic units renovate them bump up the rents mm -hmm. so this is where we're doing all right beautiful so then my next question has to do with the best person to reach out to you and of course uh you know everybody tends to be looking for beginners who are looking to get into this business so they can explain how that works. If you have 506B deals, you're not supposed to entice investors, but uh, everybody has these different uh, unique skill sets. And so generally I'm looking for sponsor KPs and I'm looking for locals because uh, I'm from the internet. So those are what I'm looking for. Uh, who is the best person in the audience to reach out to you, Alex? Um, I think locals. Mm -hmm. yeah, locals, yeah. Locals. Because mm -hmm. have connections with the locals can bring us to deals sometimes, and and it's valuable for us. Mm -hmm. Excellent, excellent. And then as far as how to reach out to you, me, I've got the distinct last name, and LinkedIn is the best spot to find me. But if you scan this QR code with your phone, that'll bring you to the FAQs page of 506BME, which is a service that I offer to document your investor relations for 506B compliance. Whenever you're talking to new investors, syndicators, stuff like that, you're supposed to have it documented so that when the SEC audits you, that you can show them all of your communications and show that you weren't um, uh, playing any funny games. But uh, Alex, if people want to reach out to you, is, is LinkedIn the best way or uh, are there better ways? Yeah, LinkedIn is definitely the best way. Just look for Alex Hodnev, which is K-H-O-D-N-E-V. Uh, shoot me a message and let's connect. All right, beautiful. And then the last thing, it's actually not for you, Alex. It's for you in the audience. It's a public service announcement. If you've been watching these videos and you've been noticing like searing pains in your eyeballs and like migraine-like symptoms, it's probably because there's a big, awful red button that says subscribe right here and it's free to get rid of it you just click on it and it turns into this beautiful great you should really see the gray button it's great and of course i'm kind of biased though i want you to click it because if enough people do then youtube will actually start paying for these videos instead of me and i think that would be absolutely amazing but what it actually does is it means my videos might show up on your list of suggestions you can go ahead and ignore those suggestions i just appreciate the fact that you spent this time with me just like alex i appreciate you joining me today this has been great getting to know you better Thank you so much, Dan. It's been a great pleasure. Awesome. Thanks. Make sure you 506 B me. Any syndicators, make sure you 506 B me. Hi. Oh, hey. Yeah, here's my code. You got your QR code scanner. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Just hold it right in the square there. Okay, cool. And now you hit open in browser. Okay. Okay. Are you already logged into 506 B me? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, so there's my video. So now I'm already on your watch list. So when you get back to your hotel, you can find out what my core competencies are and my level of sophistication. Sound good? Yeah. I love your hat. Real estate's a scam. That's really funny. Yeah, that's funny. Nice meeting you. You too. 506 B me, everybody.